My name is Allison Bocking, and I'm the Director of Youth Ministries here. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. It's good to see you, and we hope that you feel welcome and at home and invite you to worship fully with us this morning. If you're watching online, um, live, and have any celebrations, concerns, or joys, we ask you that, that you jot, jot those down in the comment section, and we'll share them during that time of joys and concerns. This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll be praying and singing together, hearing God's word, reading and proclaiming as we focus on the one who draws us near. Let us worship God. Welcome to Bethlehem. Would y'all please stand? Please help us sing this first song. If you don't know me, my name's Daniel. It's good to have y'all with me.
You may be seated. It's time to receive uh, this morning's offering. We have sent out giving statements for 2023. Um, hopefully, you've gotten yours. I was in the I was in the workroom when they were putting those together, so I got mine. Saved a stamp. Thank you, Dana, for that good stewardship. But if you have any questions on those, please contact the. Uh, church office. We're working now on the 2024 budget and should have that uh, report on that for you soon. So if the ushers are ready, we'll receive this morning's offering. Let us pray. Loving God, may this offering be used to make your amazing love known to all. Remind us that we're all called to love you and serve you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and redeemer. Amen. hard to believe I have faith you will do greater things it's my time to go here before I leave go tell the world about me I was dead that I taught you I've conquered death and I hold the key where I go you will go to someday there's much to do here before you leave so go tell
its joys and concerns time. Steph was driving home the other night and came in and said, I came home about the usual time and it was still light out. So I know I don't know if that's a God sighting, but it's definitely a joy. We've obviously passed winter solstice, right? Um, but I do know that the baptism of Louisa Faulkner Harris in the early service was definitely a God sighting, a great, great worship service earlier. Where, where else have you seen God at work or what um, prayer concerns do you have, A.B.? So our number three kid, Chris, just got engaged uh, two weekends ago to his girlfriend, Megan. So we've got another Hawkins wedding Amen. on the way. Congratulations. Yeah. My aunt and uncle are about to have another baby, and I'm going to be an, ev an even bigger cousin. All right. Congratulations. Uh, Mike. My last remaining aunt, Barb Stinson, passed away this week after a very, very short battle with pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So I'll be heading to Cincinnati for the memorial next weekend. Okay. Pray for your aunt. Loss. Oh, where are you? Okay, let's spend a moment in quiet reflection as we approach God in prayer. God of infinite light and fathomless goodness, we come this morning and place our lives before you in gratitude and praise. We really need so little, but you provide us with so much. We're grateful this day to weave our prayers with the prayers of your church around the world. We gather this day seeking the ability, the wisdom, and the courage to live as your people. We so often get so caught up in the busyness of our days that our vision becomes narrow and we fall short of reflecting our new life in Jesus. Lord Jesus, you call us to follow you just as you called James and John and Matthew and Martha and Mary to live a blessed life as we serve you. We thank you for Louisa, as your beloved child, and for her response this morning to be your disciple and to be baptized, we thank you for her family and for all those who love and have nurtured her. Holy Spirit, we pray that you'd fill us with the joy only you can give. Help us to redefine our lives so that we may live abundantly in the sure and certain knowledge that Jesus has conquered death and even now prepares a heavenly home for us all. We pray for all of those who are ill or who are hospitalized. We pray for the families of our church and community. We pray for our Stevens ministers and those they serve. We pray that you would fortify the sobriety of those who suffer from addictions and bring healing to those who suffer with mental illness or loneliness. We pray that you'd give wisdom to our world leaders, to our national leaders, to our state and local leaders. Replace selfish partisanship with ethical justice and concern for all people. And now, gracious Trinity, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from
This time we're going to invite the children to come forward for children's moment with Cade Botts. Buddy. April doesn't get intro music, but I do, so I'm really glad for that. <laughs> No, take a note of that, Daniel. So, we had a baptism this morning. Do you guys know what a baptism is? Have you ever seen one? A few words as possible. What is a baptism? That's pretty accurate. So, <laughs> baptism, it's really simple. Just water's involved. I was actually baptized at the pond. So they put me in a pond and they dunked me in the water. Yeah, um, I've seen some COVID pictures of people getting sprayed with water bottles. So we're so creative. But it's just water. It's so simple. So it's not really what is a baptism. It's more why are we doing this? So Jesus gives us, well, he doesn't give us, he tells us, commands us, go out into the nations, make disciples, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So if Jesus tells you to do something, that's a pretty good reason to do it. But does that really satisfy your want to know why? No, it doesn't. So let me tell you a story. There was a man named John the Baptist who was Jesus' cousin. And he was preaching in the wilderness. And he was baptizing people. And right on time, Jesus comes. And he's like, John, I want to be baptized. So John takes Jesus. He dunks him in the water. And when he pulls him out of the water, <laughs> um, the Bible says... The spirit flew up like a dove. The heavens opened, and God spoke and said, This is my son who I'm well pleased. So that's an awesome moment. And the moment we had in the first service was pretty awesome as well. So I'm going to take a moment, and I'll come back to it later. But how old do you think Jesus was when he got baptized? Close. He was 30 years old. The girl that got baptized this morning was nine. But in Jewish tradition... To be a priest, you have to be 30 to start your ministry. Can you believe Jesus waited 30 years to start preaching? It's wild. So what do you think Jesus did for those 30 years that he wasn't preaching? <laughs> well, he was a carpenter. So that's what he did. That was his job. It was Joseph. So <laughs> she's smart. So... In the good old days, there wasn't schools like we have today. You couldn't choose. Well, you could choose, but you really didn't have a really say on what you did. If your father was a baker, nine out of ten chances, you're going to be a baker. That's what you're going to do. So Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, who raised him, was a carpenter. And so that's what Jesus did. He did carpentry work. But when he got baptized, that, that stopped. His ministry started, and that's when he started serving God. And that's one of the reasons why we get baptized as a sign is we're telling the world, hey, we're not part of this earth. We are God's children now, and we are, we're here to serve him. And we're going to start our ministry regardless of what God wants us to do. This is what God commanded us to do. Yes, the Ten Commandments is part of that, but there's the golden rule. But the, the purpose of baptism is just to show the world that we're going to follow Jesus. And so that's why we baptize people as a sign to show everyone that we've been saved. And just like when Jesus got baptized, the Holy Spirit is in that. And it was definitely in it this morning. And uh, the Bible says when we get saved, there's a big party in heaven and all the angels rejoice. And I don't know what they do for baptisms, but I do know that God was well pleased with what happened this morning. And I hope one day you all can be baptized as well. Did I clear things up for you? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Y'all want to pray with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for all you've given us, for your grace and salvation and for baptism, for that we can be a sign to others, God, that, they, that you are Lord. Mm -hmm. And we pray not only that we get baptized, but that we can go out into the world and baptize others as your son commanded us. And we just pray that we can be more Christ-like, 
and that means being more loving and caring and empathetic to others, Lord. And we just want to pray for these children that they can come to your salvation and seek you out and be baptized themselves. And we pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. The children are now dismissed for Children's Church. Uh, so we'll see them a little bit later. Would you please stand with us and sing, uh, I Need Thee Every Hour.
have C. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Mark, chapter 1, 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Daniel. Everybody. Will you pray with me and for me? And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as almost all of you know, when Steve Lefevre was appointed to serve as the pastor of Pleasant, uh, Pleasant View United Methodist Church back at annual conference, we, had, we interviewed a ton of people for our youth director position on Zoom, some in person. Ron Whitler and I drank prodigious amounts of coffee in my study and in restaurants around town as we met with people who might be interested in the position. Our search committee did an awesome job networking and interviewing uh, uh, and doing initial interviews before people came before the full SPRC committee. They advertised in the conference website and LinkedIn. We prayed a lot. It was hard work, a long process, but it paid off. Amen? Because now we have Allison Bocking, who's joined our staff as our youth director. Allison grew up in the United Methodist Church. She served on the staff of United Methodist Churches and more recently as, as the uh, Canon of Youth Ministry at Christ Cathedral Episcopal Church in downtown Nashville. She hit the ground running. She's getting to know the, the youth and the parents and, and is just a great addition to our staff. And I'm grateful to her for responding to that call. Certainly grateful to the search committee and to SPRC. Bo, y'all did a, a great job. Certainly grateful for your making it possible for her to be here as well as myself and all the rest of the staff and most of all i'm grateful to the lord for answered prayer you know i've i've uh, down through the years i've hired lots of youth directors and associate pastors and other staff members and and the process is almost always the same you know, whatever size the church, and I've, I've served in Presbyterian churches, I've served in the Church of the Nazarene, the United Methodist Church, and you always want the same thing, right? You want the best candidate with the most education, someone who is a people person with some emotional intelligence, right, who's a team player who can work with other people someone who loves God, you can afford, right? And you check as many of those boxes off as, as, as you can. So, in other words, our process for bringing a staff member on board of a church or a Christian nonprofit isn't anything like what we heard when our text was read. 
when Jesus chose those who would be working with him in his ministry, right? His earthly ministry and who would take over and lead and grow the church after his death and resurrection. Jesus did not advertise in the conference website. He didn't go to LinkedIn. I don't think he Googled anything. He didn't go to Duke Divinity School. He didn't go to Trevecca University. He didn't go to any rabbinical school. Where did he go to find those who would work with him and teach with him and baptize with him? He went out to the lake. He went out to where the working poor were plying their trade. Those he had joined him with his work had no ecclesiastical title. They didn't have experience in the ministry. They didn't have a degree from a rabbinical school, from a divinity school. They knew how to fish, some of them, at least Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John. One of them at least knew how to collect taxes, Matthew. But they had no ecclesiastical titles. They had no experience in the ministry. They were not rabbis. And come to think of it, neither was Jesus, right? Jesus was not ordained, was he? Jesus didn't have a degree from a rabbinical school or a divinity school. Um, so he was a lot like James and John. Jesus technically, and, and Cade referred to this in children's time, Jesus was technically what's known in the Greek New Testament, because I checked, uh, as a tectone, a tectone. He was a craftsman, an artisan. And in that day and time, like, like Cade mentioned in the, in the children's moment, if your dad's a baker, you're probably going to be a baker. If your dad's a farmer, you're probably going to be a farmer. So Joseph was a carpenter or a tectone. Now, I know that the exact word in the Greek is tectone because I checked. After doing some research, I finally got my Greek New Testament out of the shelf, and I looked it up. So I know that's the word, but unfortunately, I don't know exactly what a tectone is. Because you know why? Scholars are divided. Some scholars say a tectone is a carpenter, someone who works with wood as, as opposed to other car artisans or craftsmen. But then there are other scholars that say, no, the word tectone just means artisan or craftsman. It could be a carpenter who works with wood. It could be a stonemason. It could be someone who works with metal. So the reality is, I don't know if Jesus was a carpenter who worked with wood or a stonemason. I do know there's a lot more rock and stone over in Israel than there is wood, but we don't know for sure. But what we do know is Jesus worked with his hands. His hands would have been calloused and rough. He was not anyone that people would have expected to be a, a rabbi, except for maybe his mom, who Luke tells us was pondering all these things in her heart right? He was, he was an artisan, a craftsman. And for him to pull that apron over his head and lay down that hammer and walk out that carpenter's shop door and leave it forever was a lot more significant than I think we realize because it just wasn't done. It was considered disruptive, disruptive for someone to leave a craft they had been trained to do their entire life. And I'm sure, as, as you know, we don't hear a lot about Joseph after jo Jesus was a child, right? In fact, the last thing we hear about Joseph was when Jesus and his family and, and other members of his village went to Jerusalem when he was about 12, right? And then he got lost, remember that story? Well, the next thing you know, Joseph gets lost. We don't hear any more about Joseph. I don't know if there's a connection or not. So there's a lot of speculation that, that Joseph might have died early in Jesus' life. But whether he was alive or not, 
It was a radical, radical move for Jesus to leave being a tectone and to pick up teaching. But did you notice when our text was read, he's not the only one who made that kind of transition? There was Simon Peter, there was Andrew, there were James and John, and especially James and John are described as leaving their father in the boat with the hired workers. And Robin, in my Common English Bible, study Bible, if I, I look down in the footnotes, and you know what it says? I'm, I, almost, I almost had you read it for me because I know you got that for Christmas. But anyway, here's what it says. It says, for them to have left their father in that boat with hired workers that they had, you know, they'd been trained their whole life to take over this business, that would have been not just disruptive but scandalous. There's their old gray-haired pappy fixing his nets, and his children just get up and leave, abandoning. Would have been disruptive, maybe even scandalous, but have you ever noticed Jesus doesn't really mind shaking things up sometimes? Jesus doesn't mind challenging the status quo. And I know that's not what we want to hear, right? What we want to hear is Jesus is pro-family. What we want to hear is Jesus just gives you peace and comfort. Jesus, when you invite Jesus into your heart, he makes your life easy and takes all your trouble away. And you know what? There's some truth to that. I can attest to the fact that Jesus can get you out of some trouble. You know, when I began following Jesus, there were people who were very happy for me and excited. And some of those people, I kid you not, some of those people weren't Christians. They had no interest in being Christians, but they said, Craig, dude, we knew you needed something. Didn't know what it was, but if that's what it takes, then we're, we're happy for you. There were people who were happy and excited that I found some meaning and purpose in my life, which I did not have. I can't even begin to tell you the trouble that Jesus got me out of. But guess what else I discovered? I discovered not everybody was happy and excited that I had chosen to follow Jesus, including my own dad. So yeah, Jesus can rescue us from trouble, but you are going to face some challenges precisely because you follow Jesus. It's just the way it works. I think sometimes we forget just how fundamental a change it is when we get bold enough to say, you know what, I'm going to do things God's way and not the world's way or not my way. I was um, reading through my devotional guide this week, Lectio, 365, which if you're looking for a devotional guide, is a pretty good one. It's a phone app, Lectio 365. You can, you know, read through it every day. And in one of the, the days, they, they included some quotes from Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael was born in the north of, of uh, Ireland in 1867. And from the time she was a little girl, she wanted to be a missionary. Kind of reminded me of my wife, you know. From the time Stephanie was a little girl, she wanted to be a teacher. And so as the oldest sister, guess what her and her brother and sister played when they were at playtime? School. And, you know, they might have gotten recess, they might not, but they played a lot of school when Stephanie was a little girl. And you know what? She went on to be a pretty good educator. In fact, an exceptionally good educator. In the same way, Amy Carmichael, her whole life, wanted to be a missionary. So she became one. She, she was sent to Japan for a while. She was sent to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. 
But then, ultimately, she served as a missionary in India for 55 years and never returned home. She established a sanctuary that housed a thousand children, some of whom were little girls at risk of falling into prostitution, and she wrote 30 books. You might have, you might have read one of her books. But interestingly, um, Amy has said, you know, the real challenges that we seem to face as Christians aren't the big yeses. It's not the moment that we say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but it's all those little choices that we make day in and, and day out. And she made some pretty big yeses. Yes, I'll be a Christian. Yes, I'll be baptized. Yes, I'll be a missionary and never return home. But here's how she talks about the, the tests that come as we set out to follow Jesus. And this is from her book. Uh, a very present help. She says, the tests. Anybody ever felt tested as a disciple of Jesus in your walk? You feel any kind of spiritual test ever? She says, the tests are always unexpected things, not great things that can be written up, but the common little rubs of life, silly little nothing. Things you're ashamed of minding, one scrap. You know, you see those kind of dynamics in the life of James and John. There were some huge yeses in their life. Yes, I'll follow Jesus. Yes, I'll leave my father's business that I've been trained to take on my whole life. Yes, I'll say yes to a life where I have no 401k. I don't, think, I don't think Jesus had any 401ks for James and John or Simon, Peter, and Andrew. There was no vision insurance. There was no dental insurance. It was just get out of the boat and follow me. They made some big yeses and, and, and were huge in their ability to do that. But where did they get tripped up? It was those little things, like, for example, when they're walking down the road on their way to their next ministry endeavor, and they can't stop arguing about which of them is the greatest. I am the greatest follower of Jesus. No, I am the greatest follower of Jesus. It's those, those small things. So what can we learn from this story about the call of James and John and Simon Peter and and Andrew. The good news is, God gives us grace to say yes in the big decisions of our lives. That's called, in the Methodist Church, prevenient grace. But God also gives us grace for all those little choices that come along all the time. That's called sanctifying grace. The little choices that we make that can seem unimportant but actually determine who we really become. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Allison is going to come now and tell us about a choice we can all make in our walk with Jesus. Coming up soon, right? to um, make a soup at home, bring it in a crock pot. You can plug it in, to, um, in the gym. We'll have some tables set up, um, but we um, are going to compete. And I uh, was talking to Dana this week about the soup cook-off, and she said that Joe said that we don't set the bar for our soup because a lot of it has Velveeta cheese in it. So I think the challenge is, is to make yours without Velveeta cheese and see if we can win Joe over. Um, I do have an award-winning soup that I'll be making, and so um, look forward to y'all participating and uh, supporting our youth um, here at Bethlehem. Amen for the soup. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, would you all please stand with us for our last song?
please sing in remembrance of the goodness of God. One, two, in the paths of steadfast love and faithfulness, in the big decisions you make, and in all of life's small choices, trusting that God goes with you as you dwell in the light of God's love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Y'all have a great week. Amen. Two, three.